Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our College Credit Plus, or CCP for short, virtual information session. Let me make sure. Share my screen. There we go. My name is Donald Bean, and I serve as the College Credit Plus coordinator here at Kent State University at the East Liverpool campus. And let me just begin by saying thank you. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us this evening and learn more about the College Credit Plus program. We recognize that schedules are busy. We know that your time is valuable, so we are going to do our best to honor that tonight. I just want to begin by giving you a quick overview of tonight's agenda. Let me see here. Make sure my camera is working. I apologize if you cannot see me. Um, but let me give you a quick overnight of tonight's agenda. We're going to begin with a presentation on the what and the why of College Credit Plus. This presentation is going to provide an overview of the College Credit Plus program, eligibility criteria to participate, the types of uh, courses students can take, how College Credit Plus courses impact high school graduation requirements, and then some of the benefits and potential risks of participating in the program. After this, CCP representatives from Eastern Gateway Community College, myself from Kent State University and Youngstown State University will briefly discuss their admission processes and their requirements for their respective institutions. These representatives, along with your middle and high school counselors, um, will then entertain questions regarding the program. If you have a question during any of these presentations, um, I encourage you to write it down so that you can ask it during the Q&A time at the end. You're welcome to ask questions in the chat throughout the uh, event. Um, we'll do our best to answer those in real time, but um, if you save them to the end, it might be easier to make sure that none of them get lost. And all questions will need to be asked through the chat function since video and microphone access is unavailable to attendees in a webinar. So lastly, this webinar is being recorded and access to the recorded recording will be uh, provided to all schools participating this evening, which simply means if you really want to watch it again, you will be able to at a later date if you think that will be helpful. So what is College Credit Plus? College Credit Plus is Ohio's dual credit program where qualified students can earn high school and college credit at the same time by taking college courses. Who may participate in the program? The program's available to qualified students in grades 7 through 12 who attend an Ohio secondary school or receive homeschooling instruction. Students may participate in the program by applying to participating colleges. This includes all Ohio public colleges and universities, universities such as those represented here tonight. Students may also apply to participating private or out of state colleges. Keep in mind, students may apply to multiple colleges at the same time, and they may even attend courses from multiple colleges at the same time. So, for example, it's not uncommon for local students at schools such as your own to be simultaneously taking courses with Kent State and Eastern Gateway or YSU in the same school year. Now, what courses do students take? In the program, you'll have the option to choose from a variety of courses, and we'll talk a little bit more about this later on in the presentation. However, note that some courses may be restricted by prerequisite requirements or eligibility rules. So, for example, students who want to take um, something like a college level math are going to need to demonstrate their readiness for the course, and that readiness may require some additional testing. And this is simply because we don't want students taking courses they're not academically ready for. We want you to be successful. It's also important to note that college courses taken in the CCP program can satisfy both high school and college requirements. For example, students who take a college English will not only be meeting a future college graduation requirement, they will also satisfy a high school English graduation requirement. And there's a calculation for this. A three credit college course, which it's typical of most college courses. Most college, college courses are worth three credits, converts into one high school unit or one high school credit. Now, in order to earn this credit, the student must successfully complete the course. And I, I think that goes without saying. But keep in mind that the grades you earn in the college course will also be reflected on your high school transcript 
as well. And this includes withdraws and or failing grades. In fact, the high school transcript must match the grades on the college transcript. So if you earn an A in your college course, that A is going to be reflected on your high school transcript. If you earn an F in your college course, that grade of F will be reflected on your high school and college transcripts. Now, when are courses offered? Students in the program may take courses during the summer, fall, and or spring semesters. And this is a good reminder that colleges operate on a different schedule than high schools. At the high school, many if not most courses run the entire school year, August to May. In contrast, colleges operate on semesters, which are typically 15 or 16 weeks in length. So think August to December or January to May. So these courses are going to be shorter in length and summer even more so. Summer courses, at least here at Kent State, are only eight weeks or five weeks in length, but they cover the same amount of content as a 15 week fall or spring course. And this is why most college advisors do not typically advise students to take summer courses, especially if it's your first CCP course. If this is your first, if next year will be your first time taking a CCP course, we encourage you to start with a fall or spring course. And then if you have success with those, maybe consider taking an accelerated summer course. Now, with that said, students still are able to take summer courses. It just may not be the most advisable decision. Now, where are courses offered? Students may take courses at their local high school if courses are available, and I believe every high school represented here this evening has college courses offered there at their campus. So that's an option and a great option at that. Uh, students may take courses on a college campus. So for instance, we have students that may travel to the East Liverpool or Salem campuses in Columbiana County and take a course live on campus. Or what is becoming an even more popular option is students can take courses online. So now let's get into the application pro uh, process for participating in the program. And the first question to ask is, am I eligible? CCP requires students to demonstrate eligibility, and there's a couple of ways of doing this. First, obtain a remediation free score on one of the standard assessment exams, and we'll look at what those exams are on the next slide. Or two, have a cumulative unweighted high school. Noted, I didn't say middle school, high school grade point average of at least 3.0. Or have a cumulative unweighted high school grade point average of at least 2.75 but less than 3.0 and have received an A or B grade in a relevant high school course. And number three is actually something new to the program this year. Now, I recognize this is a lot to process. Um, just know that each college will work with you and will help you determine if you meet the eligibility requirements. Just wanna give you a sense of what is required tonight. Now, colleges can use the exams listed here for placement. And using those exams, they'll review your scores against the statewide standards as the guide. Uh, the CCP representatives from each college will explain how their institution handles this during their presentation a little later in the evening. So we don't want to get bogged down in this right now. Step two of the application process is to apply for admission to your college of choice, keeping in mind that you'll be required to meet the admission requirements of that college. You'll also be required to complete a permission slip that will be provided as part of the application for admission process. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, I don't know how to apply as a CCP student to a college like Kent State, Eastern Gateway, or YSU. Well, you can always contact the college to learn more about the requirements, process, deadlines, et cetera. This information is also readily available on their websites, and you'll be receiving specifics about this process for each school represented here a little later this evening. But it's important to remember that colleges have the final decision on student admission, not your local high school, not your teachers or your parents. So it's important to make sure you understand the application process and deadlines for the school or schools you want to attend. Students are also required to complete a questionnaire stating they possess the necessary social and emotional maturity and are ready to accept the responsibility and independence that a college classroom demands. And we'll discuss why this is so important a little later in the presentation. 
The next step is course registration. Ashley, I'm sorry, are you talking to me? What's that? Are you guys are you guys able to hear me? I can hear you. There are a couple of folks who cannot hear, but I um I don't know if it's on their end or I think some people had some wrong links. Okay. Um, um sorry. Seems I like kept the majority hearing, can hear. I, I turned down my uh my volume because I kept hearing the uh people coming into the waiting room. Oh yeah. <laughs> I was I was afraid that was gonna come through my mic. I didn't realize that it, it might I might not actually be catching some of these important announcements. So I'll keep my volume up. Please let me know if there's an issue with with what you're hearing. Sorry about that, folks. Um, so the next step is course registration. And if you meet eligibility requirements and are admitted to the college, the college is then going to communicate your next steps, which include academic advising and course registration. Um, during the advising process, your academic advisor will discuss your course options based on your placement and your course prerequisites. We're now going to transition into a discussion about the type of courses CCP students can take, but let's begin with a reminder that CCP courses can also satisfy high school graduation requirements. So, for instance, just as we said before, if you take a course at the college level, let's say a history course, this course may be used to satisfy your history requirement at the high school. In fact, the Ohio Department of Higher Education has developed a crosswalk to help schools navigate this process. And I do believe that we may be sharing a link to that document in the chat at some point this evening. However, your school counselor is always your best resource for understanding how the courses you take at the college will impact your high school graduation requirements and mandatory testing requirements. And graduating high school is your first priority, so you definitely need to be mindful of these requirements as you go along. Now, what about grades? How do your grades in college courses impact your high school transcript? So the College Credit Plus grades earned in the college course is the same grade that will be on the high school transcript. And this is a reiteration of what we've already said. Um, if you earn an A at the college level, your high school transcript is going to show a grade of A. If you earn a grade of D, your high school transcript is going to show a grade of D. And these CCP courses will be factored into the high school and college GPAs. What about weighted grades, how do CCP courses factor into this particular calculation? Well, it works like this. If a high school uses a weighted grading scale for advanced placement, international baccalaureates, or honors courses in a subject area, then CCP courses in the subject area will be weighted using the same scale in order to calculate the student's grade point average and class rank. And if you're unsure how or if your school weighs grades, please consult with your school counselor because I do believe there's some variance between the schools represented here tonight on how they handle that. College Credit Plus has also built some rules around which courses students may take. So for instance, students must complete their first 15 credits in what are called level one courses. And these courses include uh, what we would call highly transferable courses. The state of Ohio uh, historically identified these as uh, what we call Ohio transfer module courses now called Ohio 36 or um, transfer assurance guide courses tag courses. They also include courses in information technology or IT computer science anatomy and physiology foreign language courses that are part of a technical certificate courses that are part of a 15 or 30 credit pathway and courses in study skills academic or career success. Colleges are required to post their level one courses and most do so on their website. I've actually added a picture of a 15 credit hour pathway of level one courses from our website here in the slide as an example. Now, once a student completes their first 15 credits in level one, he or she can then enroll in what we call level two courses, which are any other allowable college courses for which a student meets the prerequisites. So for instance, if you're a student who wants to major in something like psychology, reaching level two courses will allow you to begin taking upper division major courses beyond general psychology. Courses like abnormal psychology or social psychology or adolescent psychology, assuming you meet the other course prerequisites. CCP has also designated some courses that are what are non-allowable 
and these include private applied courses with one on one instruction, such as performing art lessons. So unfortunately, you're not going to become the next Yo-Yo Ma or John Mayer through CCP. Um, courses with high fees, study abroad courses, and we think of high fees like at Kent State, that would be our flight courses because flight time is, is very pricey. Uh, physical education courses, pass fail graded courses that was allowed during COVID um, provided some extra flexibility for our students, but that is now no longer allowed. Students do have to receive an earned grade for the course. Remedial courses are not allowed. So for instance, if you want to come and take a math with us uh, at one of our respective institutions tonight and you test into a remedial level math, which would be a high school level math, we're going to have or encourage you to take that at the high school because CCP will not allow you to take that with us. Or lastly, sectarian or religious courses. So this is a big question we're often asked and uh, one of the counselors um, had asked me to talk about this a little bit tonight. How many classes can students take in the College Credit Plus program? Let's start with per year. Each year students may be enrolled in up to 30 credits, but we have to factor in high school courses. So we have to include your high school courses. And there is a calculation, a formula for doing this. And what we do is we start with that number 30, which is our maximum allowed credits. And then we subtract the number of secondary school units a student is taking. Now, how do we factor this all together? We got to figure out how many secondary school units are, are being taken. And let's do a hypothetical. Let's say as a student, you're taking an English, a math, a science, a social studies, um, something like choir or an extracurricular, and then an elective. So you can't see it, but I'm holding up six fingers. You're taking six secondary school unit credits. We're going to assume they're all one credit each. What we do is we take those six credits and we multiply them by three. So six times three is going to give us 18. What we do is then take that number 18 and subtract it from our total maximum allowed of 30. 30 minus 18 is going to give us 12 credits. That student in that scenario would be eligible to take 12 CCP credits. Now, I, I know that's being the first time you've heard this, that's not going to be something you probably remember um, readily but your school counselor will definitely be able to help you with this calculation. What you need to take away tonight is we have to factor in your high school credits as we're considering the total amount you're able to take. Now, over the lifetime of CCP, a student may take up to 100, uh, 120 credits or what would be the equivalent of a bachelor degree. Now, if a student enrolls in more than 30 credits for the year, so there's 30 credits allowed, you're going to go over that number. You have a couple of options. Option number one, and your school counselor will discuss this with you, is to drop the course. And this is the, probably the most common option because most students don't want to um, be paying for what is otherwise a free program. So we would need to drop that course that takes you over 30 credits before the, uh, the drop or during the drop deadline where there's no consequence for doing so. Option two would be to pay for that entire course, including tuition fees, books at the college's standard rates, not at the reduced rate that the local high schools are paying. So if a student is taking um, 29 credits, somehow they ended up at 29 credits and they want to take another three credit hour course, that would take them up to 32 credits. CCP does not allow us to have charge you just for the two that go over 30. You would have to pay for that entire class. All right, let's transition now and discuss some of the differences between high school and college. And these are some things families really should be considering before enrolling in the CCP program. The first subject is knowledge acquisition. So at high school, information is provided mostly in class. Out of class research is minimal. In contrast, at the college level, coursework will generally require more independent thinking, longer writing assignments, and out of class research. Study time. The high school level required homework ranges between one to three hours per day. At the college level, there's a general rule of two to three hours of homework for every hour spent in class, which typically equals to three to five hours per day. Now, these are generalizations. There's always exceptions to the rule 
but this is a pretty standard equation. What about tests? The high school level tests are sometimes given weekly or at the end of the chapter. At the college level, tests are generally fewer in number and they will cover more material. It's actually not out of the norm for a class to maybe have three tests in a final paper and that'd be the extent of the grades, which leads us to this grade grades at the high school. There's numerous quizzes, tests and homework assignments at college. few tests and fewer, if any homework assignments that will be used to determine final grades. Role of the parents and, and this is an important one because this is an adjustment I think for a lot of folks. The high school level parents are strong advocates working closely with teachers and counselors. At the college level, parents still serve a really important role, but it changes into being more of a mentor and a support for the student. And that's because the college views the student as the independent decision maker. And this is because of something called the Family Education Rights and Privacy Act or FERPA for short, which protects student education records. This means that the students will be responsible for initiating conversations with their professors, advisors, um, staff on the campus throughout their educational experience. What about accommodations? At the high school level, parents and students work with high school staff to determine what assistance or accommodations can be made for students with IEPs or 504 plans. At the college level, students must work directly with college staff to determine if accommodations are needed. IEPs and 504 plans may or may not be included in the discussion. So you probably notice there's a pattern here and it's one that places more responsibility on the student. Parents are strongly encouraged to be part of the educational process. However, in College Credit Plus, parents are no longer driving the conversations between the students and their teachers and campus administration. This becomes the sole responsibility of the student. And this leads me to what I believe personally is the most critical factor for student success in the program. If you were to say, well, how do I know if my student should participate? I'm going to respond. Uh, let's think about student maturity. College Credit Plus requires that all students in the program demonstrate academic readiness through high school GPA, standardized test scores. So that's not the issue when a student underperforms. The issue is almost always maturity. And as we've discussed, college, it's just a different experience in high school, and it's one that places more responsibility for success directly onto the student. So my advice, especially for parents of younger students, is to consider your child's maturity and their level of responsibility. Are they the type of student who completes homework on time and doesn't require a lot of work on your part to make sure the work gets done? Or do you find that it's a constant struggle to make sure they're completing assignments? Do they take initiative for their own success? If so, this could be a great opportunity for them. If not, your job of chasing down assignments is about to get a lot harder and may result in lower grades because you're not going to have access to teachers, grades, et cetera, like you do now. All right, let's transition now to discuss some of the benefits of the College Credit Plus program. I don't want you to think that it's all um, it's all negatives. There are a ton of benefits to the program. So first off, students can earn high school and college credits at the same time. We've talked about this. You get a two for one deal. It can really um, allow you to maximize and get a head start on that future college career if that's where you're headed. Um, get a head start in career planning and degree or certificate complete completion. I've had students that know they want to go into specific programs, sometimes even at a different college university, and we're able to work together to make sure they're taking the appropriate classes so that what they take not only transfers, but applies to those future degree requirements. So that's an excellent opportunity. Experiencing college early to understand the expectations of college life. I think this is really helpful because you get a taste of what college is like, but you're getting to do that while you have a lot of support around you, whether it's support at home with your family structure or support in maybe your local school where you might have some access to teachers who could be providing some academic supports. Um, plus, you get to save tuition and textbooks, textbook costs, which, as we all know, um, is something we all we all think about. What about the potential consequences? Well, if students do not earn a passing grade or if they withdraw too late from the college courses, the district may require students to reimburse the tuition that the district has paid. 
So there can be a financial penalty for students who withdraw or fail a course. It's also important to remember the grades that students earn will be on the student's college transcripts and the high school transcripts permanently. So you will be beginning your future college academic career and uh, how you perform will stick with you. Now, if a student fails or withdraws too often, future financial aid can be impacted negatively. This is something at the college level we call satisfactory academic progress. Um, federal financial aid requires that students are always completing a certain percentage of the courses they attempt. And if they fail to do that, it can put their financial aid at jeopardy. And then if students perform poorly, they may be placed on CCP probation, CCP dismissal, on academic probation, or dismissal by the college. Students can be dismissed by the college or university, even as participants in the CCP program, if they meet that criteria. So that is definitely something that can have a negative impact. And this leads us into the topic of CCP probation. So students will be placed on CCP probation if he or she earns less than a cumulative 2.0 GPA in CCP courses or withdraws from two or more courses in one academic term. And so I've had instances where a student might be taking a course that's four or five credits and taking a course that is only three credits. That course that is four or five credits is going to have more weight in their GPA. So let's say they get a D in that class and they get an A in the three credit hour course that could put their cumulative GPA below 2.0 and place them on probation. Now, if this happens, students will be subject to the following rules. Students in probation may only enroll in one college credit plus course for the one college term. Or students in CCP probation may not enroll in college courses in the same subject in which the student previously earned a DF or no grade. So if a student got a D in college writing, which is English, they're not going to be allowed to enroll in another English class the following semester. Now, students on CCP probation don't increase their uh, GPA to a 2.0 or above during the probation term, they will then be placed on CCP dismissal. And while on dismissal, students may not enroll in any CCP courses. There is an appeal process whereby students can request to be reinstated to the program, but this is not guaranteed. So how does the appeals process work? For probation, students may appeal to take a course in the same subject in which he or she previously earned a D or an F, so that student could appeal to take that English course in the subsequent semester, even after they earned a grade of D. Uh, the CCP uh, appeals process for dismissal says within five days of being dismissed, the student may submit an appeal to the secondary school to appeal CCP dismissal, or the student may appeal at the end of the dismissal semester. And each school has a policy regarding this process, so you can reach out to your school counselor for more information if you have questions. Now, what about expenses? Does it cost anything to participate in the program? And I have great news for you this evening. Drum roll, please. At public colleges or university, there is no cost to the students, families for tuition, required fees, books, which is the bulk of the expenses related to a college education. In fact, the Ohio Department of Higher Education reports that over the six years CCP uh, program has been in existence, Ohio families have saved over eight hundred and eighty three million in tuition costs, eight hundred and eighty three million in tuition costs. So it's a wonderful opportunity to receive free college credit. There may be some optional expenses that would be the responsibility of the family, things like parking or transportation. So if you're going to and from a campus or if you're parking on a campus, some uh, campuses may have a parking fee. Um, like here in Kent State, Silverport, Salem, we don't. But I know, for instance, if you were at the Kent campus, there would be a fee. So those are some things that may be incurred, but in comparison to tuition and fees, they're they're fairly small. Now, private colleges or universities, there will be no cost to the students or families for tuition, required fees and books, um, but students may be charged a small cost per credit hour. So you need to check with that college to see if they charge that fee. All right, so let's talk about this application process again. So first off, the very first step that students have to do is complete something called the intent to participate form and provide that to your public school by April 1st, 2023. Um, and I think we're going to be throwing a link to this form in the chat. So the intent to participate form is simply a way of notifying your school you intend to participate in the program. 
or that you're thinking about it. It doesn't obligate you to take any courses. But if you don't do the intent to participate form and you miss that window, it could be too late if you change your mind. So the best practice here is if you're thinking about this at all, if you're interested at all, complete the intent to participate form as your first step. Second step is to apply to the college or colleges of your choice. When doing this, you'll need to confirm with the college and secondary school if you plan to take advantage of what's called option B or option A. Option B means a state pays for your courses. Option A means it's self-pay. And as you might imagine, nearly everyone chooses option B. As a matter of fact, I've personally never had anybody choose option A. Maybe one of my colleagues from Eastern Gateway or YSU has. Now, if for some reason you choose option A, uh, you'll self-pay for the college courses and you pay at the standard rate of tuition fees and textbooks. Under this option, you can under this option you can choose to earn credit, college credit, and high school credit, or just college credit. And I suppose that might be the one reason people would want to pursue this. For students who choose option B, all college course tuition fees and textbooks will be paid by the state of Ohio. Under option B, you will earn college credit and high school credit. And this is the default option. Students may be asked to confirm the election of option B during the advising process. I know at Kent State, we actually asked this question on our application. Now, students must inform the college and the secondary school of their option choice. The final date to change this um, would be your no fault withdrawal date, which I know here at Kent's usually about two weeks into the semester. What about support services while in the program? So. High school counselors are going to continue to private, provide assistance to all CCP students. Uh, CCP students will be assigned a college advisor and they're going to provide course selection assistance, um, advice on student goals and majors and things like that, and college support services. And then colleges are actually required to provide the same academic supports to CCP students, like tutoring, library access, advising counseling that are available uh, to our traditional students. Um, what about athletic eligibility? This is something else you need to consider. Um, it should be discussed with your school counselor. It's certainly possible to maintain athletic eligibility while taking CCP courses, but you need to make sure you understand the Ohio High School Athletic Association requirements and know that summer term CCP courses do not count um, in that factoring of compliance. So summer courses will not count in factoring your athletic eligibility. So that's one thing to consider. What about course transfer? How will your credits transfer? So certain general education and technical courses will transfer, especially from one Ohio public college to another Ohio public college. However, students should check with the colleges to confirm. And in my, uh, my opinion, this is why academic advising is so important. Good advising is gonna help you navigate questions of credit transfer, and it's gonna help you select courses that are most likely to transfer and count towards your future degree requirements. My general rule of thumb, is that if you're planning to transfer your credits to a different school than the one you're currently attending for CCP, you should be in contact with your final school choice regarding the transferability of your courses because they're going to be the ones who ultimately ultimately decide how your courses transfer and apply. All right, we're almost to the end. So as we co come to a close, let's do a quick review. And here are some important deadlines to remember. So April 1st, Students must complete and return the intent to participate form to their school counseling office. Um, check ACT and SAT testing dates. Um, if, if the school you want to attend requires these scores, make sure you're testing early to meet admission deadlines if required. Semester deadline, summer semester deadline is going to be early since courses usually start in May. So check with the college for um, all these deadlines, important deadlines. Um, It's redundant. Next bullet point, contact the college and discuss assessment um, testing requirements. And this is where I like to remind people to check your email. Um, email is the way we're going to be communicating with you as a student. So make sure you're checking that because this is going to be how we let you know where you stand with your application, if there's any ex additional testing that's required, how to make your advising appointment, et cetera. If you're not checking your email, you are going to miss an important message. Another thing about email, we do encourage you when doing applications um, to make sure you're using a personal email and not your school assigned email. And the reason for that is because your, your school emails tend to filter out um, some of the emails that we might be sending you that you need to respond to. So using a personal email does tend to uh, open up that access a little bit better. And then finally, 
once you have applied or given your intent form, you've applied for admission at the college of your choice, um, you do any assessment that's required, you register for your classes, you're going to meet with your school counselor to discuss your schedule and graduation requirements. And at this point, this wraps up the general presentation about College Credit Plus. I encourage you to maybe take a picture of this page if you want to um, visit this uh, state's page for more information. And with this, I am going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Sarah, from Eastern Gateway, so she can talk to you about the admission process there. Gotcha. Give me one second here. And please let me know if you have trouble sharing, Sarah. You're set up as a presenter, so it should work. Yeah. Yes. Excellent. We're there. Can you see my screen? Yep. See it just. Okay. Okay. Um, so I'm here representing uh Eastern Gateway tonight. My name is Sarah Fletcher. I'm the director of College Credit Plus for Eastern Gateway Community College. So I know that Mr. Bean went through a lot of stuff. I just have a few slides just to kind of reiterate everything that he already said. Um, but our application process, you know, one of the first things are making sure you do that intent form. Um, that is the one thing that it doesn't make the student obligated to do it, but it can also, I guess I want to say, deter them from ever wanting to do any of it again because they they never do that they start school and then their friends are doing it and then it's too late for them they sit out an academic year and then we lose the students so each year this has to be done um so we just remind students and parents that it's on the state's website it's your high school counselors have it um but this is a really important process um step two would be to apply these gateway um, we usually, I guess all the high schools that are here tonight, we actually partner with. So we would want you to check with your school counselor um, because we do application days at the high school. Uh, we've done them virtual in the past uh, due to COVID, but most of the time recently, currently, we are, we are actually at the high schools. Um, but at the same time, students are also welcome to go to our CCC webpage and it's there in red. Um, it's egcc.edu. If you are on our main website, College Credit Plus is right there at the top of the page. Um, but what we tell students to make sure they have when they're actually applying, Mr. Bean kind of went over that, they need to know their, their social security number because that's just something they have to have on, on our application. But we, we also ask for a non-parental, non-high school personal email address when the student is applying. So that way, because that's our main form of communication with the student at all times. So that's very important that they're checking that email and and that they have a personal email that will follow them with their education record records even after high school. Um, the other part, step three for us is anytime a student applies, they get what's called an a CCP application checklist. And it goes through a list of things that the students need to accomplish to go through the application process. Um, one of the things is the College Credit Plus permission form. Um, this is something that we will contact the student, we reach out to the high schools, but this is very important because in that checklist the student's going to get, there's a link to this form that can be filled out and emailed directly back to us. So as soon as you sign off on it, it comes directly back. So the student must make sure that they're looking at that application checklist and that they get that CCP permission form back to us. One thing that will prohibit a student from being able to take courses, even if they are accepted, is having this permission form on file. Step four for us would be have your high school send over your high school transcript, showing your ACT, SAT scores if taken. Um, we, we, we also do testing on the high school campuses as well. So that's something that we would set up with the high school counselor. Most of these high schools, we do testing on site there. Um, but the other thing that would help admit a student would be if they had a cumulative high school GPA of 3.0 or, or higher. Um, so if this is something that the student doesn't have, we will require them to, to do the testing for eligibility. Um, right here is just kind of a generalization of remediation free scores for the state, for the state of Ohio. 
Um, and these are our benchmark scores too, which we consider the readiness areas. So what are our deadlines? Our deadlines to apply for summer of May 12th, uh, fall June 30th, and then spring September 29th. This stuff is also available on our CCP webpage. We have a fact sheet, we have a handbook, the course um, substitution forms um, that they were sharing the links with. Um, but this information is also available on our website if you ever wanted to look at any of that stuff to see what we do offer and what our deadlines are. And then lastly is, this is my contact information at the top under Sarah Fletcher and then Patrick Carbon, who is the College Credit Plus Academic Advisor. Um, he would be the advisor for all students, um, but his contact information is below as well. So if anybody has any questions and wanted to shoot an email um, afterwards, this is where you can reach us. And you can also go to our webpage again and, and click on our name and it'll take you directly to our emails. All right, thank you, Sarah. That's it. Thank you. All right, let me get mine ready to go. All right, so I'm going to take us a few minutes to discuss the CCP admissions process here at Kent State University, which includes the East Liverpool and Salem campuses. Um, I'll have my contact information on the last slide if you want to take a picture of that. So the first step is to complete the intent to participate form, and I won't belabor that point. We've already talked about that tonight. Make sure you're getting that into your counselor by April 1st. Um, doesn't obligate you to anything, but at least it puts you um, in a position where you can take courses if you so choose. That's step one. Step two is to answer a really simple question, and that is, are you a returning student? So did you enroll in a course during the 2022-2023 school year? Now, notice I didn't ask if you applied last year as a CCP student to Kent State University because some students apply but then decide not to take courses. I'm not talking about those students. A returning student is a student who applied and also enrolled in a Kent State University course. And this is important because how you answer this will determine what you need to do next. Now let's start with new students. So if you did not, did not enroll in a course last year at Kent State University, you are a new student and you will need to complete the new student CCP application process. Step one is to complete our free online CCP application and you'll see the deadlines on the screen. Summer is April 15. The application for a deadline for fall is June 1st. And um, like Eastern Gateway, uh, we partner with all the schools tonight and we always have an application day where we come out to the schools and help students apply. You're welcome to do it on your own. That's wonderful. But we do usually come around to the schools and help. Second step is you need to complete a CCP permission form. This form is available online and it's going to require a signature from both the student and the legal guardian. Um, once this form is completed, it can be mailed to the campus of your choice or sent via email to the CCP coordinator at that campus. As a matter of fact, our, our admission system will even allow you to upload it directly there. So that's an option too. But for example, you can email me if you plan to attend courses through the East Liverpool campus. And then lastly, we'll need a copy of your official middle or high school transcript. Once all of these are received, we're gonna review your transcript to determine if you are college ready. You'll recall earlier from the presentation that we there's standards we have to meet. At present, those include a non-weighted cumulative high school GPA of 3.0. Um, you can use qualifying scores and ACT or AccuPlacer tests or have a cumulative unweighted high school GPA of at least 2.75 but less than 3.0 and have received A or B grades in relevant high school courses. Um, I know that's a lot of information to process. We'll work with you every step of the way to make sure you're aware of your options. And if you don't meet the GPA requirements, we're happy to uh, offer the AccuPlacer test to students free of charge, similar to the ACT, but it doesn't have a, a time limit. And that's something that will come on campus to the local high schools and, and provide to students. Now, the process for returning students is different. Um, returning students do not have to go through everything we just said. So there's no online application. You don't have to redo the permission form. You've already done those and you've already demonstrated your college readiness. So if you are a returning student, you simply have to respond to an email that has three questions. 
This email will be sent to your Kent State email address, and it starts sending mid-February, and then it's going to send every two weeks until you respond to it. It comes from East Liverpool CCP admissions, and here's a sample of what it will look like. It's going to ask if you are still a student at the school you attended last year. If you've changed schools, you're going to need to provide the name of your current school. And in this situation, we'll also need an updated transcript from your new school. It's going to, next, it will ask you to confirm your expected graduation date, and it will have you correct it if it's wrong. Now, keep in mind, the year is what we're most concerned about with this question. I know a lot of students are uncertain about the month and day, and that's okay. You just want to make sure that that year is correct. And then finally, you'll be asked if you plan to continue into the CCP program for the summer, fall, spring semesters, at which point you will answer yes and submit. So it's a much simpler process for returning students. Step three, once we've received all of this, you'll be sent an email inviting you to schedule an appointment with your academic advisor sometime in mid-May. Uh, you'll book your appointment online, and when you book it, you will choose either an on-campus or a virtual online appointment through Microsoft Teams where you'll work with your advisor um, to discuss your options, discuss your goals, and choose courses that align with those. Um, this is also another reminder to please be checking your email regularly because if you don't, like I said, you're going to miss um, important messages that you need to respond to. Once you've met with your advisor and you have scheduled courses, we'll have you go back and communicate your plans to your school counselor just to make sure everyone's on the same page. And then if we have to, we can make changes as necessary. So hopefully you found this helpful. Please feel free to contact me with any questions you have after this evening. Um, take a picture of the screen. Um, scan the QR code if you want to visit our CCP uh, site. And with that, I will turn it over to Sharon Schroeder from YSU. But let me stop sharing my screen. It's all yours. Thank you so much. Good evening, everybody. Uh, first, I just want to um, um, thank uh, Kent State, our colleagues at Kent State, for um, offering up this information night and inviting us to it. Really, really do appreciate it. Um, it looks like I am having a bit of a computer issue and it's not allowing me to um, share my yeah. screen. So um, what I'll just do is um, let you know um, for in terms of YSU's uh, program, uh, in order to participate, you do need to have ACT or SAT scores um, for our program, and that would be used for both the CCP eligibility and the uh, YSU admission criteria um, in order to be both eligible and admitted. Uh, you can have um, two options with ACT scores. Uh, one is a um, having a composite score of 17 or a combined score of 920 on the SAT. And then you have to have um, uh, GPA scores of 2.0. That's both a cumulative and a core GPA 2.0, and then meet one of the college readiness benchmarks that was talked about earlier. Or a student could have a 3.0 overall GPA unweighted, a core of 2.0 GPA, and a composite score of 17 or on the SAT 920, um, and they could be qualified for eligibility and admission with those scores. Um, if the core three GPA threw you, uh, no worries. It's it's just a matter of us calculating out the GPA for the student only using the math, English, science, social studies and any foreign language classes that they have taken. So if your student or doesn't have a C or better in those classes, then they're going to want to either contact our office or discuss with their school counselor if this is going to be the right program um, for them to apply to for us or not. Um, we don't round up for the GPA and for middle school students. We do look at your middle school grades and any classes that you may have taken for high school credit to determine your GPA um, for uh, qualification in the program. Um, if by chance you don't have an ACT or an SAT score yet, no worries. We do offer a free um, eligibility and admission test. We utilize AccuPlacer as well. Um, we do do this virtually, so students can um, schedule time to uh, meet with a staff member from our testing center 
uh, to complete the test from the comforts of home. Uh, the, you would simply contact our office to uh, schedule a time or sometimes the schools will invite us down and we can do testing on site um, if they've scheduled that. But if not, you can always contact our office and we'll schedule, um, get you going on the steps for that. Uh, to qualify for eligibility and admission to YSU's program under this option, uh, you would need to have the 2.0 GPAs and then score at least a 250 on the reading section of the AccuPlacer test in order to um, qualify. So uh, you contact our office if you'd like to utilize this option. You have until March 28th to complete the test but only until March 21st to sign up for the test. So um, if you are interested in that option, then you can contact our office um, at 330-941-2447. And um, if you receive a voicemail, just please leave a message and someone will get back to you um, within two business days. Um, it's important to note that if you do qualify for the program through this option, you still need to apply and complete an online application. Just completing the test is not going to fully admit you into the program. We still would need for you to complete the online application. So again, letter of intent date by April 1st with your CCP school coordinator, meet with your school counselor, discuss your options, decide um, what classes you're looking at, and above all else, please make sure you're staying on track for your high school graduation requirements. While this is a great program for students to take advantage of, you are first and foremost a high school student and getting that diploma really does need to be your priority because without it, it doesn't really matter how many college credits you have, um, it's not going to allow you to continue on until you do. So keeping that communication open with your school counselor and making sure you're staying on track is really going to be important. Um, if you do decide that YSU's program is a good fit for you, then you'll complete our application, which is going to be available online beginning in January 2023. Um, you'll complete a signed uh, parent consent form, send in transcripts, any scores that you have. We have a campus education plan that you'll review with your um, uh, school counselor that they'll send in to us. And then um, we'll review everything and make a final um, decision for um, admission into the program. Um, our deadlines, thank you so much. Whoever put that up on the screen, I appreciate you to no end. You're um, welcome. <laughs> Ashley found it. And I'm sorry we didn't share it sooner. Um, the deadlines to apply to our program um, for um, if there's any non-public or homeschool families on the call, March 28th is the deadline that we need to have your application materials in by um, in order to help you meet the April 1st deadline for um, submitting the letter of intent and your funding letter to the state. But for all other public school families, April 7th, we have one deadline for the entire year. Um, the last time that we will accept scores for admission for summer is the February ACT. Um, for fall and spring is April, and we'll use March SAT scores for admission for any term. And then, of course, our eligibility and admission test um, the deadline for that is March 28th. Um, and um, we'll always accept updated ACT scores for course placement, but for admission, we do need to have scores from those dates um, for four. Um, once you've applied, um, we'll review your application and we'll send you home an acceptance packet that has your YSU student ID and an enrollment checklist that includes your YSU email account and how to activate it. And as everyone has said before, please, 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 please always check your college email account. That is how we will communicate with you about next steps in terms of what you need to do to um, participate in the program. And that includes scheduling with your academic advisor, attending an orientation, completing course placement testing, 
registering for classes. It's all only going to be sent to your college email account. So it's really important that you check it regularly, especially over summer. School may be out for, for you at the high school, but during the summer, that's when a lot of us are doing what we need to do with you to get you prepared and ready to go for fall. And just remember, admission does not guarantee course placement if and those requirements are going to vary by course. So if you're not, um, if you're required to complete course placement testing and you do not, you are going to be limited on the type of classes that you can register for. So um, just in closing, um, you see our brochure. Thank you again so much for putting that up. Um, our website is ysu.edu forward slash ccp um, discuss you know review everything is on the website that i just discussed and more um, discuss that with your family if you need to sign up for testing please do so by the deadlines submit your letter of intent to your school submit your application keep your acceptance packet when you receive it and check your email on a regular basis so that you're completing all the deadlines needed for course placement testing orientation advisement etc um, if you have any questions um, our contact information if you can scoot to the last page of that brochure for me um, is ccp at ysu.edu or our phone number is 941-2447. Um, please reach out at any time. That's what we're here for. You know, any question you have, um, just reach out. This, this program is very much um, layered with lots of things that students have to do, that colleges have to do, that schools have to do. And, and sometimes it can be a bit confusing. And that's what all of us are here for, is to help you work through it so that you're able to uh, meet all the deadlines, do what you need to do so that you can participate and take advantage of it fully. Um, for any of the school counselors on the call, if by chance you are not coming to YSU's Counselor Day on December 2nd and would like us to, e to mail you hard copies of our brochure and parent consent forms, just drop us an email at ccp at ysu.edu and we'll put those in the mail to you so that you can share them with your families. And that is all that I have. My apologies. My computer is failing me tonight. No, it is, it is all good. Um, so this is a great time to ask questions. Um, I'm sure that Sharon and Sarah will hang out for a little bit. If you would like to ask um, any questions of us about the program, you can do so via the chat. I also want to thank you all for joining us. Um, I know the counselors have told me that if you have any additional questions about the program, please feel free to reach out to your local school counselor and they will do their best to guide you as well. So at this time, uh, please feel free to um, dismiss yourself and leave the meeting. But if you want to hang around um, and ask some questions, we'll be here for a little while to help with that. Thank you all so much.